hope remains. When we start thinking about Jesus, we think about the hope that he brings. We think about the, the miracles that he's done, that we, only the ones really that we, we read about, right? When we think about the ones that he does in our lives, Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our only hope. And that hope remains today. <clears throat> in, my, in my younger days, I was raised in the Catholic Church. Um, now, I'm not here to bash any other de denomination. I will, I will never do that uh, from, from the pulpit. But I, I grew up, uh, as I grew up in, in that church, I saw things and, 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 and did things that, that I didn't completely agree with. And a lot of things I saw I, I didn't agree with, so I set it in my mind that when I was 18, when it was time to leave home, I was never going to return to the church. And so that was my, that was my mindset when I, when I went off. And, and many of you that have heard me give my testimony before uh, have heard me say that. And so, you know, many years after, after this, uh, after my wife uh, led me to the Lord when we when we got together. Uh, God gave me this sense of refreshment and renewal in my spirit. He awakened He awakened my spirit, and this was this was at the Nazarene Church. When we started going to the Nazarene Church, I started hearing all these stories in the Bible like I'd never heard them before. I got so excited. I started hearing, I, you know, even, you know, like the story of the Exodus uh, with all the plagues, you know, the story of creation. Wow. The story of Noah. Tim Hawkins does a pretty good thing about the, the story of Noah, but I, I, won't say that. I won't say what he did. But uh, the story of Noah and the story of Jonah, you know, these are all great Bible stories. I remember when I was a, when I was a baby Christian, I would watch the Veggie Tales. Have you ever watched the Veggie Tales? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they teach you the basics of the Bible stories. You know, and then as you start to grow, then of course you, you, you start going, going deeper. But, but, you know, I was, I was completely blown away by these stories I was hearing. It was like I was hearing, I know I probably heard them as a child growing up in church, but it was like, it was like God woke, up, woke my spirit up and now the stories could come in, and I could hear them, and I could respond to them, and I could change because of them, you know. So um, it was like a it was like a child. Um, this is why this this is a this two part series that we're doing. Um, it could easily it's, it's a lot of verses you see on there, eleven through one through fifty seven. Well, yeah, we're not going to do fifty seven verses today. <laughs> I would not do that to you. <laughs> but that's, it, it could easily be a four-part series, but I only have two weeks to get this done in. So we're going to split it up between today and tomorrow. But it's the story of Lazarus. And I, and I don't know how familiar you are with the story of Lazarus, but, but it's, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And we, find it in, we find it in John chapter 11. Um, I think... I think one of the things that I like about that story so much is that there's so many life lessons learned within uh, the story of Lazarus that not only were relevant then, but they are relevant now. I mean, God, God's inspired word is transcendent among time. Relevant then, relevant now, Relevant in the far future when we're not even around anymore. It'll be relevant then too. And so people will be able to read these stories and be able to apply them to their lives. And I'm like, wow, you know, when I see some of these, you know, I see the, the verse that we'll see next week, but you know, the shortest verse in the Bible is in this is in this story. And we see Jesus' humanity. And so uh it just it just kind of you know, it makes us identify with him, right? Because what do we do when we see someone that's hurting sometimes? We weep. We weep with them, you know? So, great biblical truths 
But first, I want to I make it clear that John wrote this gospel with a purpose. To prove conclusively that Jesus is the Son of God and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. That's the, that's the purpose that, had, that John had when he wrote the whole gospel. That Jesus is the Son of God and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. In every chapter of John, Jesus' deity is revealed. And Jesus' true identity, identity is understood well, by, the, by the names that he has given or by the titles that he has given. The Word. You've heard him called that before, right? The only Son. Lamb of God. Son of God. The true bread. Life. Resurrection. The vine. But the formula is, I am. When Jesus uses this phrase, he affirms his, his pre existence and his eternal de deity. When Jesus, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, which we're going to see in this story here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. In his, in his ministry, Jesus, he, he, he meets with individuals and, and preaches to great crowds. We've, we can picture him doing his Sermon on the Mount, you know, with, with all the people out there listening to him. He preached to great crowds. He trains his disciples, and he debates with religious leaders. The message that the Son of God, that He is the Son of God, um, receives a, a mixed reaction from people, doesn't it? Some worship Him. Some become really puzzled. Some shrink back. I've talked to someone before about Jesus, and they have shrinked down. It was I was I was blown away by that. And some, they just move to silence Him. As we as we read in in the in the gospel, you know, there's a lot of people that that just you know there's a lot of people that did believe, but there's a lot of people that didn't, also. And they were there; they saw him. We see the same varied reactions today, don't we? Times have changed, but people's hearts are still hard. Go out there, go out there in the world. And start talking to people about Jesus and see how hard people's hearts really are. Because you'll see, you will face rejection at every corner, just about. But, you know, if you're looking for that one, if you're looking for that one, you, know, you, will, you will face a lot of no's. You know? Uh, you know, my, my, one of my prayers is that, you know, when we, when we read these Bible stories, we, it, doesn't draw, it doesn't draw us away. It doesn't make us become puzzled. It doesn't make us shrink back. But it makes us draw close to God. And it makes us want to be in a relationship with Jesus. And that we will want to come and worship Him like never before. If we were to, if we were to look at a uh, timeline uh, of when this story took place, we would know that this took place towards the end of Jesus' ministry. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Now, now Lazarus, he, he, he became really sick. And, and Mary and Martha, they, they, they turned to Jesus for help, as anybody should, right? They believed in, in Jesus' ability to, to help because they have seen his miracles. And we too know of Jesus' miracles by what we have read in the Gospels and what we have, and what we have uh, experienced in our own lives. I'm a product of a, of a Jesus encounter. You're a product of a Jesus encounter. Amen? We can look around and see miracles. We can see His miracles all the time in our lives and in other people's lives. 
And how often do we forget? How often do we forget that God already knows our situation? Do you think that you can go anywhere, do anything, think about anything, and God not know it? God knows our situation, and our life is in His hands. Hey, if it is our time, then it's our time. If it's not our time, then it's not, but it's in God's hands. Amen? Amen. We don't have the final say in anything. Um, he, knows, he knows where we are, and He knows what's going on. So, so as, let's, let's go ahead and look at the, at the beginning of the text here. Beginning in chapter 11, verse 1. Hopefully everybody can see that, okay? Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, The sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And after that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. When you read that, it's kind of troubling in a way, isn't it? <laughs> when he heard that he was sick, he decided to stay two more days. Wow. You know, a, a family member would have said, hey, I'm catching the first uh, bus over there. I mean, they're... Jerusalem and, and uh, Bethany are only two miles apart. You know? I'm catching the first camel out. I'll be there in 15 minutes. But no, Jesus decided to stay two more days where he was. Any trial a believer faces can ultimately bring glory to God. Do you believe that? Because God can bring good out of any bad situation. And, and right now, Jesus is being alerted to a bad situation. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are, accord, who are called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28 Now let me ask you a question. When trouble comes, do you grumble? Do you complain? Do you blame God for the situation? Or do you see your problems as opportunities to honor Him? This is, a, this is a great life lesson. As believers, we should always turn to God first and come to Him as a little child would. It does so much for our relationship with Him because He wants you to come to Him first. It does so much for our witness I think about that time when Lisa received news of tragedy in her family. The first thing she did was drop to her knees and beg God for His help. It does so much for your witness. God's timing is so perfect. Would you agree with that? <laughs> We live in a world where, where we want the answers to our prayers. We want it right now. And we want the answer that we're expecting. But we forget one thing. God doesn't work like that. God works in His own time. And God will answer you with what He thinks you need. Not with what you think you need. Right? Right? The deity, the deity of Jesus Christ is, 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 showing, is showing through in this moment. He is God. He is fully God. He is fully human. Jesus, Jesus loved this family, and he, he often stayed with them. He knew their pain, but he didn't respond immediately. 
And, and we find out that his delay had, had a specific purpose. His delay had a specific purpose. And what was that purpose? To bring glory to the Father. He can bring glory to the Father through any situation. Even a situation where a person is deathly ill. He can bring glory to the Father. Had he had Jesus gone there, had Jesus rushed over there, his disciples would have been with him. And if his disciples were with him at that time, their belief wouldn't have been increased, as we're going to find out. So Jesus said, okay, I'm going to wait a couple days, and then we'll, and then we'll go over there. See, God's timing, especially his delays, they make us think. They make us think that he's not answering. You know, sometimes when, sometimes when you think that, when you hear, uh, when you say a prayer, you don't get an answer for like a minute. <laughs> or an hour, or a day, a month, a year. How many of us have been praying for our children since they were babies? You know? We may not see the answer to that prayer in our lifetime. But you know what? God works in His timing. So God is answering. And God is responding to our, to our prayers. He may not do things the way we want. But He is God. And if we believe in God and we trust Him with our whole life, then guess what? We need to trust Him with that too. Amen? He will meet all our needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Patiently wait His timing. Don't, <laughs> don't try to do things yourself. Don't try to do things in your own strength. Don't try to do things in your own wisdom. It's just going to get you in trouble. Okay, I say that. I say that, and 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 I'm I'm one that can just talk about that all day, trying to do things in his own strength and in his own uh, wisdom. Yeah, end up making a mess out of things, big time mess. Verse eight. Rabbi, the disciples told him. Just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again? See, Bethany was a danger spot that they're going to go back into. Aren't there 12 hours in a day? Jesus answered, if anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble, because the light is not in him. See, daylight symbolizes the knowledge of God's will, and, and reliance on his guidance. And night, the absence, night symbolizes the absence uh, of this knowledge combined with self-reliance. So if we're walking in the dark, we're trying to walk in our own strength, not relying upon God and his wisdom. When we move ahead in darkness, we will, we will be likely to stumble, and that is for sure. When, when we walk in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own power, which really isn't anything, when you're talking about the grand scheme of things, things will get messy. The disciples are taking their cues from uh, their circumstances rather than their father. They're, they're very aware of the danger that their opponents are, are presenting here, but they're not in tune with the voice of the father. We need to be in tune with the voice of the father. And how do we get into tune with the voice of the father? We read his word. We pray, and we, we associate with, with other believers. We come to church. We get in tune with the voice of the Father. Friends, how often do we look at the problem that we're facing instead of, instead of fixing our eyes upon the one who can bring us through that problem? Yeah, there are times where we, we don't feel like he carried us through, do, do, do we? But we know he was there. And there's times where he will let us walk through that. Uh-oh, did, did I switch that accidentally? Oh. In all my excitement up here, I switched it. 
<laughs> How many times, though, have we been told to turn it over to the Lord? And instead, we try to fix it ourselves. I know I keep harping on that. But I've learned, especially in relationships in my life, God knows best how, how I should behave, how I should speak to others, and how I should treat others. He knows way better than I do on that. And He shows us in our Word, and He shows us, shows us in His Word, I mean, through, and through other believers how we should do it. And, and He tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we don't ask the question, well, who is our neighbor? We know who our neighbor is, don't we? The point is that they need not worry about what will happen to them, for, the, for they have the light of the world with them. And when you walk into any situation, if you have the light of the world with you, then you're walking in the light. And you have the wisdom of the Lord with you. He said this, verse 11, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought the, that he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'll probably have to go on that. Okay. Um, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. Remember I said, remember I said I'm glad Jesus didn't run over there, just, just drop what he was doing and run over there with his disciples. Because now they, they didn't have to see. They didn't see yet what he's getting ready to do. But let's go to him. Then Thomas called twin, said to, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. Wow. Well, they all know that Bethany is a danger zone. That's where, that's where people are constantly wanting to uh, pose death threats to, to them and to Jesus. You know, So here's an incredible picture of, of faith uh, by Thomas. He's, he's not following because he sees how everything fits. He's following out of loyalty to Jesus himself. He's a model disciple at this moment. As Thomas, this is the same Thomas that was doubting later on. As Thomas follows Jesus into to what he thinks is death, he's answering the call expressed in the synoptics that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Verse 17. <clears throat> when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the in the tomb for four days. Four days. Yeah. Barb, you've got it right. Wow. Yeah. I don't think there was embalming fluid back then, was there, or anything like that. No, no refrigeration. Just slap them into the, into the tomb and let them go. <laughs> Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to to comfort them about their brother. <clears throat> as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she, she went to, to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Then, yet, yet even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. She had kind of a misconception of Jesus, what was going on with him. She was seeing more of his humanity than she was his deity. Jesus' response, your brother will rise again, uh, comes across as a common consolation among those Jews who, who believed in the future resurrection. This is, that is how Martha takes it, which is another case of misunderstanding. Not that her belief in the future resurrection is wrong indeed. It is, it is confirmed by what takes place. But Jesus is speaking of something more profound. The very foundation upon which the future resurrection itself rests. Jesus' words are so comforting. His presence is so comforting. He's the only one who can bring peace 
and understanding in any situation. In my experience, when I go to, to see someone who is grieving, I will likely say nothing unless I'm asked. Just being there is good, but when Jesus is there, he is the source of our peace. He is the source of our comfort. And his presence and his word bring comfort to our lives, especially during our times of grieving. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Now the word resurrection in Greek is anastasis. The Greek noun anastasis is derived from the word, the verb anastemi, meaning to literally to stand up and then by extension to rise up. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's what he asked her. Jesus has the power over life and death, as well as the power over sin, to forgive sins. This is because he is the creator of life. He who is life can surely restore life. Whoever believes in Christ has a spiritual life that, that, that death cannot conquer or diminish in any way. When we, when we realize his power and how wonderful um, his offer to us really is, how can we not want to commit our lives to him, to his service, to everything? In 14.19 he said, Because I live, you will live too. Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. So as I get ready to close on this first part, I reflect back to the beginning when we learn that Jesus uses the phrase, I am. He affirms his pre-existence and his eternal deity. Jesus always was. Jesus isn't a created being. He always has been. He is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. He is, he, he is God with us. Emmanuel. Amen? See, that's one of, the, one of the beauties of this story. We get to see Jesus fully human and fully God. We experience his power through love and compassion for people. We experience his humanity by being there and experience with him and seeing and experiencing the same things that we do. We learn through this story that we are part of something so much larger than ourselves. God's timing may not be our timing. I think that's one of my things there. There it is. God's timing may not be our timing, but he is always on time. Now, if you're not familiar with the outcome of this story, well, just wait till next week. Your mind and your heart are going to be touched. Or you can just read ahead if you want. But God's timing is, is always perfect. And we learn that we should not ever lean on our own strength and on our own understanding of things. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Amen? And Jesus has the power over life and death. Okay, I got a little bit behind there. Jesus has the power over life and death. The people back then had the advantage. They had an advantage that we don't have now. They had the advantage of being with Jesus and seeing his power. Yet some people still had trouble believing, Many, but many people did, right? In John 20, Jesus says this, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Now I have one question for you today as we, as we depart. Do you believe? Do you believe? 
We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The one who always has been, always will be, and forevermore we're going to see him in eternity. Right? The one who has power over life and death. The one who has the power to forgive sin. The one who we place our faith in in order to come to the Father. Think about those things as we go out this week.